You are listening to the Let Me Overthink About It podcast, where I dive into a series of topics that occupy my anxious mind. I'm Sam Ador, overthinker extraordinaire. This week, I'm overthinking about strength with a stroke with my pal, Alana York. Alana's new album, Destroyer, was just released on May 17th, and she has an album release event coming up at the Miracle Cultural Center in Truro on Thursday, May 23rd, and you don't want to miss it. Here's our chat. I am here with Alana York. Hey, Alana. Hey, Sam. I'm so excited to be seeing you and chatting with you. It's been a long while. Yeah, this is wild. It's it's really wild. Yeah, and we're not that far away. I'm, you know, still in our, our hometown, Truro. You're, are you in Halifax? Um, we're actually just outside of Halifax. Okay. So, yeah. We bought out of town, so we're living the dream of kind of living in the oh. in the woods and or like yes. you know in the country, but close to Halifax. So yeah, I love it. So just for context, Alana and I went to school together. We met in high school. Hey, was it? Yeah. It must have been. Yeah, yeah. And you lived in the country then too. You were out in Bass River. Yeah, I'm from Bass River. I know. I was going to say you're in, you're from Truro, but I'm like, no. I know she's going to correct me. So I. <laughs> it's part of our home. Ian is from Truro, like yes. Ian Bent is my husband and co-producer, yes. so he's he's from Truro. But you know, if you're from out, if you're from Bass River, you're from Bass River, and then you go to high school in Truro. Yeah, um, so it's sort of like hometown, but it's like home area, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Or Colchester County, right? Like, yeah. Well, yeah, it's all yeah, it's all the same. I um course I don't know if I ever shared this with you I'm going to on my podcast I had a huge crush on Ian when I was in high school I don't know <laughs> I feel like a lot of people did like I feel like that was just a thing um and I was talking to somebody the other day because I was I was talking about your show that's coming up at the Marigold Center in Truro and I was like I just have this weird connection to the Bent family like I had this crush on Ian I actually just took singing lessons with Catherine Bent last year who is married to Ian's brother Colin yeah, uh, who I love. And of course, I my dear friend Amanda Bent um, is Ian's cousin. And she and I have collaborated on our kids books. And we're just good pals. So anyway, I'm just like, why do I have like all of these connections and you? And did Mr. Bent teach you drama in high school? Right. Yeah. And he was like my favorite, my favorite teacher in high school. So yeah, there's like all kinds of Bent connections. Yeah, I love it. There's definitely music in that family big time. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, like they're an amazing family. And that's like, you know, so when we were in the high school musical at CC, mm -hmm. as some of us were, so yeah, like Ian was Kanicki in Greece. That's in where the crush started. Let's yeah. be real, yeah. Alana. So if you watch that and like the choreography and the, like the, <laughs> you know what I mean? Then that's, that could have something to do with it. I mean, a lot of us were crushing on Ian Bent and, I yeah. yeah, I know. It's uh, his ears are burning wherever he is in your house right now. Your his <laughs> ears are burning. He's probably going to be embarrassed to hear this, but anyway, I'm saying it anyway. It is what it is. Hey, that's great. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I just briefly mentioned that you have a show coming up at the Marigold Center in Truro. I was going to say hometown, but I'll say home area. Yeah, hometown show. Yeah, for sure. And I'm so excited that you're getting to play in Truro. What is that like? What does that feel like for you? I know you've played here before, but with this new album it really feels like a homecoming and we haven't seen a lot of people like you know because of covid and um we became parents in 2020 and yes. um yeah um congratulations thank you yeah we haven't been out and about a lot like we don't get up to Truro that much or it's hard to coordinate and see people like if we do um yeah so this is just such a wonderful like venue wonderful community wonderful place to come to, home to and yeah. um there's a grand piano like uh and yeah so it's like our home that's like our home show kind of like home as yeah. in like original home yeah um so that's uh next week on the 23rd right so like yeah that's like 
we're recording this the week before your show, which I love the speed that we're going to get this out. So we're recording this on, uh, I think it's the 15th today. Your album comes out on Friday, and then this is going to be live on the 19th, and then your show's on the 23rd. So it's all pretty cool. It's all happening. It's all yeah. happening. Yeah. And then we're playing Halifax as well, which is like sort of our more like current home. So yeah, like after that. So yeah, like these are choice shows. We're not playing a lot of shows um, yeah. yet. And um, yeah, I was just rehearsing today with the band and oh my gosh, it just, it just feels so amazing. Um, yes. You have an incredible team. So to bring out this whole new phase, this new work. I haven't played the Marigold in a really long time. It was probably Nova Scotia Music Week showcasing or something, you know, back then. And so, honestly, Alana, I think that's the last time I saw you was at that showcase. And that would have been, probably, I don't even know, like 2018 or something crazy like that. Let's not count, right? <laughs> yeah, fair. I know. I wasn't going to say how, how long we've known each other either because I'm like, I mean, the gray hair tells a lot, uh, tells the story, but uh, your hair is gorgeous. Like, I love it. Oh, I love your hair. It's so funny. I, I, I go back and forth on the bangs all the time and I'm like, I just can't bring myself to do it, but I love the bangs. <laughs> so I want to get into um, the story that's happened to you over the last couple of years that led to this incredible feat of coming out with your new album and sort of the inspiration that went behind it. So I had the opportunity of watching your CBC special Um and, you know, of course, cried my eyes out and just felt so happy and, and proud for you. Um, but can we talk sort of maybe fill folks in who aren't aware of, of what happened to you just a few years ago? So um, in November of 2022, I woke up with my little guy who was two at the time and I couldn't move my left arm and it was sort of just swinging around like a marionette's arm. I just couldn't yeah. control it. And I thought that's weird. And I, my first thought was like, okay, I got to change a diaper here. Cause it's morning. And so it was like, Oh, Hey Ian, can you give me a hand? Cause my left arm isn't working. So like, you know, you don't even think like, mm. You know, not even thinking like I can't control my left arm. You're more like I got to change a diaper. So, like, do you know what I mean? Like, that's that's yeah. a wild way of thinking about it. And then, um, and then I was having like so. Then this different things were it was changing. Like my I had this headache that was kind of developing. The other piece is like that. Um, I couldn't use my phone. I couldn't conceive of how to use my phone. Mm. Um, so Ian was Googling, like we were like, sort of like, oh, maybe this is like an atypical migraine or something like that. Right. Yep. He's doing the Googling because I can't, what I don't, what I now know in hindsight, like there were left, right things. Okay. Um, happening. And so like being able to tell left from right. So, um, you know, I couldn't use my left arm. I was, I didn't know where it was in space. Um, I, it was like, it was a bit of a process, but like long story short, I called 811 mm. and that was incredible because, you know, the nurse said to me, like, you need to go to the hospital and, and you need to go there now as soon mm -hmm. as you can. And the fastest way that I've determined that you're going to get there is your husband's going to drive you. Right. Um, and then you, yeah, like you're sort of like, I don't, the last thing you want to do is this is really counterintuitive, but you know, what this is coming to is a story of my stroke. We didn't know I was having a stroke. My brain was bleeding at the time. And oh, like even just saying, sorry to cut you off, but even just hearing those words just sends chills all through my body. Yeah. Sorry. I had to interrupt you there. It was nuts. And, and we didn't even find out for a few days that I'd had a stroke, but I was like hospitalized. So I'm jumping around a bit, but this is what I'm trying to tell you when your brain is bleeding. So first of all, I tell people now, like if you have the worst headache of your life, go to the hospital, mm. if you have the worst headache of your life. Plus like some, some other weirdness, like definitely go to the hospital. Yeah. Um, so like a typical headache, like go in and say, I've got the worst headache of my life. And what you want to do when your brain is bleeding is you want to like crawl back into bed. 
And that's what some people do. Of and course. they die. And, you know, you would know of some stories that where yeah. that has happened amongst celebrities and things. Um, and that's just like, that's just tragic. So like mm-hmm. when I was riding the ambulance, like that day later going from hospital to hospital, the paramedic was like, maybe it's a good thing that your arm wasn't working because like, then there was that other symptom that yeah. was like, okay, let's, so, you know, like we went to our nearest hospital. I felt like I was going to, to emerge. I felt like I was going to like fall off my chair. There were a lot of spatial things. I couldn't tie up my boots, like to go, oh. I lost my hand in my pants. Like you put up your pants, like you pull up your pants and you don't know where it is. You look in the mirror and go like, Oh, okay. It's like, it's down the side of my body underneath the, the waist of the pants. Or, you right. know, like, yeah. it was, and still we're like, you're just puzzled and you're like, yeah, it really wasn't typical. Like I'm familiar with stroke symptoms like you know like side of face or especially right. like so it really kind of wasn't typical in in a lot of ways so because it sounds like a lot of just general confusion right like just kind of not really being aware of what's ha- like well you don't imagine that something like this could be happening and you just think i have a headache that's really yeah. like right and then why is my left like it just wasn't flagging somehow but the pain was really increasing so Mm. we get in there like I just feel like you don't know what to think you're in so much pain too so then we get into like the CT scanner like pretty fast and it's never good when you're jumping the line and emerge like then you know like okay there's something's going on and uh you're like, that's the one good thing about <laughs> you're like I jumped not the line a good, and it's not a good thing right like because you know when you're in there and you see somebody of else jump on and you're like okay that's not really a lucky kind of thing that's right yeah yeah and so I just remember a doctor coming to me like very soon after and just being like um hi just here to let you know like you're the reason for your headache being so bad is because your brain is bleeding at this point like I'm kind of asking Ian to like hold his hand there. Like I'm just like in desperate, desperate pain that I can taste. And I did want to bite the mattress. I remember that like when I was still on the phone with him. So when you're in that much pain, like you also can't think. You really can't think or make decisions, right? Yeah. Um, so when he came in and said, like, your brain is bleeding, and that was like the moment where I believe I asked him if I could hold his hand. And, right. um, and he was lovely. And then it was like, okay, that really explains the pain. And then I started calling a couple of friends and, uh, it was like, okay, what, what's hap- what happens now? And, and then it's like, okay, we're like, we're sending you to the QE2. And like, then I was admitted like for, for quite some time, like, I think I was in for 10 days or so. Okay. Because when you have a, and then like, so it was after a few days that, um, they came in with the word stroke, right? Because at first it was like your brain is bleeding Mm -hmm. and then it became like actually what happened was a stroke. And then we really have to find out why that happened because you're so young. So I was seeing other people like leaving and graduating from the hospital and everything who were much older, who had other like, and I was sticking around because they're, they weren't going to let me go um, without knowing why. So yeah, yeah. that was, that was like a really life changing thing. And that led to we were almost done the record when that happened that that was the crazy thing like the this had, current record this record destroyer okay we had worked on for years and by that point like fully mm-hmm. recorded obviously it was mixed the album art was shot and so we were like just right at the finish line all that we had left was to master we were so close to the finish line and then this happened And I knew like, even when I was in the hospital in those first few days, I was just like, this is it. This is like the ring of fire that I had to pass through Mm. to finish this record. It was a really hard record to make. And it really made sense to me. And I could just see the album art in my mind. Right. And it all made sense to me. Um, So that began a process of like my brain, like really changing suddenly. And yeah, like just a whole wild experience of experiencing my brain experiencing the stroke that I had and and how that plays into yeah mental health and health and everything and how we experience the world like yeah 
Well, and I apologize if I ask really simple, ridiculous questions, but like, do you feel like, okay, because that was November, 2022, we're now releasing that album in May of 2024. Do you feel like you have that same, like when you were connected to the album back then and, and do you feel like the same person that you were then? Or do you feel like, how does that, do you still feel connected to the music in the same way that you did when you made it? That's an interesting question. Um, I get zoomed out in a good way with time. And so now I can appreciate the songs more as their whole. Mm -hmm. Because we get really zoomed into the minutiae of like creating, producing the music. Right. Fair. Yeah. Because you guys do it all. Hey, like you and Ian. Yeah. We self-produced and we work with engineers who record, edit, and then mix with us. Um, so other people's hands are on the dials and they they contribute enormously as well. Um, but in terms of like the arranging and the, like, yeah, producing, like we're the ones who are hands-on making all those decisions for every song. And so, yeah, we get really, really zoomed in. So at every step we're completely hands-on. So yeah, zooming out, then like you hear the songs as a whole and then they take on like a whole new meaning. Right. So it all feels very new to me. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time with it because it was like we finished it and then it was like, okay. And um, and then we got to go into like the creative visual work, which is like another aspect where like, you know, making videos, for example. And I began to work in the medium of dance for some of my videos, like as part of my recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, like there's just been a whole, a whole lot of ways of experiencing the music. And now we're like, working on this live show, which is a whole other way of experiencing the music and sharing yeah. the music. So it all feels really new to me. The music feels, some of these songs are really old, but they all have yeah. just this new life. Yeah, I know. I'm so excited to hear it. And I love what you've put out so far. Um, Thank you. And and that's what I was anticipating that you would say, but I, because it would give sort of that different perspective to, I didn't realize that the album had already been basically completed prior to your stroke so that that's interesting how it's shifted for you yeah no this was like a year of recovery basically right like a a year of basic recovery and then another half year of the the evolving abilities and returning to work it's not just black and white like oh I'm going to recover for a year and then I'm good and I'm better and it's done it's a process and the brain can do basically anything to heal itself but it it needs time yeah Cause we would have mastered in the spring of 2023. So I was like, I, I was working on that documentary, like from my hospital bed, like, right. We started with the CBC, like, so I didn't really stop working, but the work changed. And then we just needed this recovery time for me to come back to life after the stroke, yeah. um, extending the, the release time. Right. And how do you, like, I just, there's, I have a million questions for you, by the way, Alana, going through my brain. So I apologize if they come out in random order here, but because I just think the process of, you know, how do I know that I'm okay? You know, like, how do I know that I'm in a place now where I can release an album, I can tour it, I can do all of those things? Yeah, that's a really great, insightful question. And it really doesn't feel like that at all in the sense of like, you're, you're not like, I'm re- like looking back, I can now tell as I've gotten better and better with time, I can't believe I was doing what I was doing then. So I, right. right. In hindsight. So I didn't know what I was going to get back. I didn't know how fully I, we, we committed to full recovery mentally in the hospital. Mm-hmm. And we just committed to that, like not knowing anything. We're just like, yeah, full recovery. We're going to do it. I la- I lost my left side. Right. So like um, returning to like playing the piano or like coordination things like this. It's been a whole journey, but it, it affects every aspect of my life. Like every, everything, my senses are really affected. Like, um, yeah, energy level, um, so many things. And a lot of what I had to do when I came home was like rest a lot. That's Mm. really hard to do, believe it or not especially when you've got a young child too, and you're self-employed. I was just going to say that particularly the young child. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And he doesn't understand like what that means. Mommy's had a stroke kind of thing. So yeah, like it was just nuts. And then you start to like, I just, I guess I just did the most that I could at any point. And I was guided by my occupational therapist as well Mm -hmm. as part of my recovery, which was really invaluable 
Um, and you do your best. And like for us, I guess, being self-employed, you, you want to get it out that you don't want, I didn't want to sit on it much longer. So we could do, so we just started, you know, we just start and we just find out what we can do. And right. The, everybody that we work with is really understanding in that way. And, and I just communicate my abilities and how I work and the way, when we started working, like, you know, I just had to say to people like, don't email me because I can't read emails yet you know kind of thing like it wasn't a yet I didn't know what I would re return to and then with other work like spreadsheets and stuff like that so like the first time I tried to do any of that stuff because I was visually affected it's just like nuts and then and then the second time you do it it's like okay yeah like so I got better through working too and it's all just like it's I'm still on that curve but even with the live performance piece now um, we had done our first band show uh, around Easter and then mm. returning to it. Now, after a stroke, like what I find with my personal experience is every time you do something after that, it's like the very first time you've done it with your new brain. So I remember like the first time I knocked on a door. I remember the first time I paid at a, like tap my card. Yeah. Um, I remember the first time I tapped that would remember my credit card. Then I remember like tapping my dad like so everything like just those are things you would never think about and everything that you do is from like learning how to walk again or if, like you know anything you do it's like I'm doing it for the first time riding a bike whatever yeah for, for the first time the second time and then your muscle memory is really fast so the first time is challenging that could be like working in excel or something yeah and, and then when you go back to it um there's that muscle memory kicks in and it's like oh yeah I'm doing this again so it's that first time. And so with live, like, so developing the new live show, we're on in ears, for example, and doing all that work. And so like even perform for audiences live and all that, all of that information coming through my senses, like at once mm -hmm. and attention, where is your attention? What are you taking in? What can you, your brain is doing so much. And that's just a lot, right? So like, and then coming into rehearsals again, you know, this week and then being like, okay, this feels like more like getting back on the horse. Like, so just yeah. because we'd done it once, it feels a lot more comfortable and a lot more like, yeah. And I just can't believe it's like, I'm steadily always getting better. Even if I don't know that I am, I could do anything. I could just sleep all the time or I could go and do overdo it, but I am right. getting better. And I, you don't really see that until you stop and compare right and the only way to really know that you can do it obviously is to try it and I think what it sounds like you're and I'm hoping is the case is that you know you're setting boundaries throughout that whole process right it's like I can only I'm talking to these people they they understand you know I can't necessarily check email or do spreadsheets or whatever and then now I'm assuming that will relate to the live performance and you'll start setting boundaries within that too. Yep. Definitely more rest, more downtime. Yeah. Um, there's things like for stimulation of protecting me, protecting me is like a whole part of like what the team does of meaning like I need rest. I need downtime. I need quiet time. I need things like that. And, um, protecting my energy, I guess is what, what that means. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Um, the other thing is like, I always updating people of what I can do because like one week I can't do that. And then like, I have to constantly be like, oh, actually I can do this now. And so yeah, it changing abilities. And then those yeah. are not always like this, right? You know, we can have an up down with that. Yeah. Depending on if you're tired, if you're hungry, those things. So I don't like those setbacks of right th those combinations. So we try to avoid having those, like you control what you can. And then there's things that you can't control. Man, it's, it's fascinating to hear the, the, when you're talking about those first, like doing those things, like to actually be conscious of, I'm just going to use your example of knocking on a door because it's like, that's something that you just don't even think about. But of course, in that first moment, when you're like, I can't, I can't quite figure out how to use my phone. Then of course, the next time you use your phone, that's going to feel so different or it feels like, what am I doing? So you're going like you're raising your hand. You're like, whoa, what is this? I feels weird. And you have this real snap flash bulb memory kind of thing. You have this like snapshot in your mind. Yeah. It's really like an out-of-body experience. Or like the first time I'd say certain people's names, for example, and I'd be like, that doesn't even seem right. Like, is mm -hmm. that my drummer's last name? And then it flows again. Like, and it, everything is just making these connections again because like the brain was repairing a lot of work 
was happening there for repair in those first few days. And I know I remember being in the hospital and only eating, like I had to eat a ton of food around the clock. Mm. I would only eat healthy foods. I would eat as much as I could get. And then I would take all the snacks from like the drawer that the nurses would tell me, like the secret stash. And, um, and then like, if I even saw a food that was unhealthy, it would, I would have, I had a complete aversion to it because my like caloric needs had to be like, so were so had to be like, so pure and efficient at that time. Yeah. Um, there were wow. a lot of wild, wild and crazy experiences and my body just knew what it needed to do. And it just made that happen. It's so fascinating. It really is. And I think too, like, you know, obviously I, I, I'd like to dive into the mental health portion of, of what having the stroke, how the stroke affected your, your mental wellness. You know, I think about you in the hospital, I think about you recovering for that year and obviously still recovering now, but what impact did that have on, on your mental health day to day? It was really wild for me because the first about three days I didn't sleep for three nights following the brain bleed at all. How and I did could, you not sleep? Well, wow. I, and they wouldn't I mean, even, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really asking. It's more like a rhetorical question. Yeah. How could you survive that? Yeah. Is probably what thinking, right. Yeah. It wouldn't even let me lay, lay flat. And there was no pain management other than just Tylenol. And then I got to figure out oh, like that yeah. I could ask for an ice pack and I would just like, put my, yeah, it was hell. It was hell. And I thought, how am I going to survive that? Like, it was really like, how am I going to survive this mentally? Right. You're just like, you're just like, how am I going to survive this? Like in a very dark, scary PTSD kind of thing. Cause like I had PTSD from something else before this. So I knew what PTSD was. And I'm like, okay, how am I going to survive this mentally? Like that's like three days, three days and three nights and no sleep, like no sleep. And then I figured out I could ask for melatonin because they wouldn't give me anything. Like, so being like super careful about the bleed and they don't like, there are a lot of things that they know they can't give me. Right. Finally, I sort of said like, what about something like melatonin? Then I got to, then I got something that could help me sleep. So I don't know if it was because I'd slept for the first time or whatever, but I must've been asleep because I woke up one morning. And so it went from like, uh, constant halluc- hallucinations, which we'll like talk about another time, but like the most vi- the most unbelievable visual experiences ever. Okay. Like, and so wow. just unbelievable. How are you even going to get through like the, the HD TV that is showing you all these things when you close your eyes. Oh and God. then I wake up after a few days of that. And then, so this is what is nuts. I wake up and I just feel amazing. And this is what's unique to like my stroke. And it's a very individual experience. I can only speak for mine. Right. I started Googling like stroke, amazing. All my problems are gone. Like, so basically with my stroke, everything that I'd ever had, PTSD, bad feelings about myself. You know, I think we all have baggage from like our childhoods or like, you know, in our our, our development, we're going to have things that like make us feel bad and feel bad about ourselves and stuff like this. So it was like wiped clean and I wake up and I'm just like, life is amazing. And my bleed was in a place where my senses are processed in the parietal lobe. So I literally had like, okay, like smells are incredible. Food tastes amazing. Everything looks incredible. Okay. So like really actual, actually directly changed. Mm -hmm. And then I walk into the hospital bathroom, the bathroom of my hospital room. And I see myself in the mirror and I'm like, who are you? This gorgeous person. I never, ever looked in the mirror that way in my life. Right. I don't think I'm alone there. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Fair. Yes. Fair statement. <laughs> yeah. And I look in the mirror and I just, I, all I see is this like electric beauty of the whole journey. The beauty is this is kind of heartbreaking. Beauty is the whole journey of where this person has ever been and anything that I've done just as another person. Mm -hmm. And I see into that. And all I see is beauty. That's just an example. I'm just giving you like an example 
talking to friends on the phone from my hospital bed, like saying things like, you haven't sounded like this in like 15 years. Like, like I was like better again. I was myself again. I was like free of all of that baggage. Yeah. Can you remind yeah. me how this was after that three days of like, after you finally yeah. had, you like, finally rested like three days of hell. Yeah. Which is like, how am I going to survive this? And then yes. a switch flipped for some mm-hmm. reason. And then it was like, this is incredible. And, and you've been like that ever since. No, because sorry, so many- I'm not making light of it. I just, <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but, but this is what's incredible. I had a precious gift. So I call, kind of called it like a disc defrag for my brain. Like nothing, no therapy or experience or drug could have like right. ever given me that, right? Yeah. So as, so a social worker who worked with stroke patients told me around that time, she says like, you've got a deck of cards with your mental health and we've just thrown them around the room. So we just don't know what's going to happen for the next three months. And it's going to take about three months for that deck to like come back together and get reshuffled. And then we'll find out what's going on. So yeah, the, the borders are off. Your brain is totally integrated and working in ways that you never knew. Like I could use my brain. I was feeling sorry for people who had never had a stroke. I could see multiple faces as one face at once. I could see like the creative and artistic powers were off the chains unbelievable superpowers. Wow. And so I was experiencing all that. And I would just kind of like sit on my bed at night at like three in the morning. And I just knew like everything about the world. And so the doctors called this like hypomania. And they said, like, okay, okay you're basically, okay. Like, you're not manic, but you're, they would class this as like hypomania. So I was in like a different, technically like a different mental straight uh, state, which I called like the crystal energy. It was like a, as a joke, but like the crystal energy would like come to me especially at night. And it was, it was wild. But so no matter what happens to me now, as like, as the, as the dust settles, as the deck gets, you know, reintegrated and and my brain and like, I come back into like normal brain um, state and everything. What I will never forget is that feeling when I woke up in the morning and I got out of bed and I went, I so free Mm. feeling so amazing. And I just thought, I bet you there are people in this world who feel this way. And I never could have, it was like, you put on like VR or something like, like something yeah. where you went into me and gave me this experience or like a, you know, like a ghost visits me, like in Charles Dickens, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah, it shows yeah. me? Okay. Yeah. It's like that. And so I will never forget that. And then I knew I'm chemically different from other people or like, it's just chemistry. It's just the brain and chemistry. Right. And you yeah. really know then and the other piece with the hallucination so like that chemistry le- like lesson if you will but of brain chemistry like that's exactly the answer but then my other takeaway was that with all the face hallucinations over and over and i just knew like the brain is like wired to recognize and process faces yeah biologically that is so important and people's faces were all that i could see for days it was just like wow. the faces of strangers just changing yeah. from one face to the other constantly and integrating into multiple faces and so we have these like hardwired things and brain and the brain is incredible it truly is and that you remember that like because you know i'm hearing this and obviously having never experienced it i'm thinking you know that might just feel might feel like a dream you know what i mean or might feel like it wasn't actually happening to you but you the way that you're recalling it to me right now is like you remember it as as you know something that that happened to you which obviously it did but it might just f- come off feeling like a dream or sort of some dream state it was super vivid like that's the yeah, thing and i so i wrote cool. a lot in there yeah and yeah. there were things that like it was just like a trip and and you kind of i thought of the hospital experience as sort of like a sleep away camp for adults who have health problems <laughs> so it was like like it was like camp because you'd wake here everybody waking up and going around and stuff like that yeah. you'd never be around that many people and so like i just it went from how am I going to survive this? Because as the individual going into the hospital environment, that's another level of like, oh my gosh, I don't, you know what, you're missing all the things of your life and even clothing and stuff, right? Like everything. Yeah. And how am I going to survive this? And then after a couple of days, it's like, I'm so into this. And we like, 
I would sing along with my roommates and like, you know, the, these memories, the humor. Um, we'd have like cocktails at five, which were like mixing the, the orange juice and the cranberry juice with some ice in a cup. Like that, like one of the nurses from the Caribbean, like came up with this for us because like I, I was just, I, you know, it was so hard. And so we had to find ways yeah. to survive. But then when, when I, once we did, it got fun and that's probably a surprise to, it was a surprise to me. Yeah, absolutely. But like, you know, you think about what you just said, humor, like that's just where we go. I think as he, a lot of us as humans, it's like, that's what else can we do? You know, like we're in this situation. We can't change the situation. You, you said it too. Like you can only control what you can. Um, and, and to, tr to be able to, to find humor in those situations is so important. A lot of connection with other people. My family has all yeah. spent time on that floor, like a lot of them for heart and stroke. Um, and yeah, I never dreamed that I would be like on that side of it, like at my age yeah. and, um, yeah, like the support and, and my family members coaching me through that and being like, okay, this is a head game and you right. got to get through it. So th th these are some of the things you can do. And and kind of like marveling at the uniqueness and the preciousness of that experience. And, and so for me, it became almost like an art installation. Oh, wow. And it was the bent of that was humor. I love that. It was, it was so wild and crazy. I think my brain just did this to survive, but like, you know, the, the, the things that were going on in there that you, you just had to find the humor in it. And I think as Nova Scotians were really like that. Yeah. And you also knew like, we're all Nova Scotian. So it was like a, does that make sense? Like it was oh, like, Oh my God, listen, and not to veer off topic, but when my mom was, she, she of course passed away uh, three years ago, but, or geez, four years ago, um, she uh, was going to have her mastectomy and we were all gathered around and we were whatever, like just coping as one does. And I remember her cracking jokes with the nurse on her way down the hall. And I was just like, how is this a thing? <laughs> I mean, she certainly set the stage for us to all feel more comfortable and, and all of those things, but we just do it. That's what we do. Yeah. And I remember feeling so grateful to be in Nova Scotia for this, like, cause everybody was sort of like, my roommate was one of my most, my favorite, one of my favorite roommates. I don't even want to say my favorite one of was like from South Shore. And he'd say like, we're having a yawn. And he had that Lunenburg accent and he was way yeah. older than me. And like, you know what I mean? We would just have a yawn like through the curtain I didn't even see him until and then once we once I got up and about I'd seek him out and I'd visit him and I'd check in on him and we did things like we trade pillows we pray for each other like with the people you'd meet and the we'd help we would really hold each other up and you make these connections that's what was a little bit like camp because you're making these incredible connections and I remember like there were people where they were probably losing a loved one there had been some something just absolutely major was going on. I was taking my exercise walks to the lounge and I just like held one of them at one point. Like I just said to them, like something like I get it and I love you and everything's going to be okay. The thing is you're just transcending mm -hmm. any day to day stuff. You're just in a different like whole place Yeah, that is really quite, there's something really beautiful about that. It's just human to human. And they know too. They know too. You know, so like the yeah. connections that we made in there were really precious. And you just see the silver linings and you know somebody's on a worse. Yeah. Um, in a worse situation uh, than you. Yeah. And one of the highlights of the documentary that I watched was when you were talking about playing piano again and having the support of the people that you were yeah. in the hospital with. That was such a sweet, sweet moment. Yeah, that was really unforgettable. And yeah, I walked over to the piano that was in the lounge and I started to play. And then I think I started to cry because it was so emotional. And mm. we were so, Ian and I were sitting, Ian was playing, sitting on the bench with me. And just to hear myself, I played anthem and, and you know, we kind of explained to the people in the room, like, this is my song and I'm a professional musician and I didn't know if I could play this before. When they knew that, like, everybody just burst into, like, this applause. Everybody celebrated so readily that my success was everybody's success because mm -hmm. other people were having, you know, like, massive, like, 
heart surgeries and ha were stroke survivors that were in wheelchairs and other like you know, debilitating experiences with their loved ones. And I remember like I was crying and a woman came over and she hugged me and she said, like, don't be sad or something. And I said, like, I'm not sad. I'm, I'm, I'm actually like happy that, you know, and so we just had this understanding and, and then we just like sat around together and chatted and whatever. And then we kept on chatting because they see them the next day. And that moment of celebration was just like really powerful, but the, the way that they celebrated for me, like not knowing me at all. Right. They were celebrating for themselves. Like people just are so hungry for any hope, any silver lining. Yeah. And I think too, the poignancy of that is like you said earlier about, you know, telling people that you couldn't necessarily read emails right away or, but also not knowing what is to come, you, I am assuming would also have moments of, am I ever going to play again? Am I ever going to perform again? And so to have that, like the weight of that moment as someone who knows you, even watching that, I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 And I talk about how like Alana York, we lost Alana York because Alana York, the like musician performer left and there was Alana York, the person. And so like mm -hmm. in those first days, just surviving as an individual person, right? That's my, your life is all that's important. And then it's like, okay, then your identity and, and yeah, like where did Alana York go, right? Mm -hmm. she, she left and she can't perform right now or play. I can't like, you know, that was nuts because I realized like nobody else can do what I do. Um, I don't think I ever realized that until it was gone and no mm -hmm. one else can sound like me vocally um, and no one else can actually play the piano like me, like in my distinctive style with my mm -hmm. songs. I thought it was more replaceable with piano, but it's actually both. And so it's like, yeah, like you can't get there that anywhere else. I, that, that sounds like a funny thing to say, but it was gone and it was coming, fi finding Atlanta York and bringing her back, the musician. Mm hmm I knew I was a musician through and through because like, like you couldn't take that out of me. When I first went in with the brain bleed, they were like, well, we'll see what happens because musicians use all of their brain and we'll see what happens. And, but I knew like that never had left. Yeah. Even if I couldn't move my body, I would still be a musician. I would still be producing. I would still have a sense of my voice, yeah. like ideas, whatever. And I would just do it through other people, but um, anything is possible. But yeah, coming back to it is, it's been powerful. It's, uh, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. also like, we don't know if I have a brain tumor, we don't know if I'm going to need open brain surgery or whatever, like, I don't know what you call that, but there's so much going, like, you don't know if we're going to play the piano again, but you don't even know if you're going to get out. Like, like it was just like, yeah. every, everything is gone. Right. So not literally everything, but like the things that you have in your life, like, yeah. So you're just in this, like gosh and and it's it's changing fast and it's changing day to day and they're assessing your what you've lost and like it's just it's really wild and just the unknown of it really like because you have totally. you, like you're saying you just don't have a clue what they're going to tell you tomorrow right so yeah yeah that's... and the mental health was like like that for sure because like I also didn't know like I was like am I cured forever of PTSD and yeah. depression and anxiety or you know it hasn't been that simple it certainly right hasn't been. And then that's been another journey of the brain coming back and then um, some evolving, like my, my identity now and my mental yeah. health now um, complicated by an invisible um, hidden disability, right? right. Like people would never know that I'd had a stroke and that I am affected. Yeah. And that's, the, and then you get used to like, okay, what can I do? It's a high at first, the recovery. And then it's a little bit like you plateau and stuff like that, but also you're like, okay, nobody understands. So that, so yeah, it's really like, it has its unique, it really has its unique challenges, but yeah. overall, like the most, and my life has changed forever, but the, but like, I, I don't appreciate when people say, I'm so sorry you had a stroke, believe it or not. Although that might be like a really natural thing to say. I don't yeah. feel that way about it at all. For me, it was like a really transformative experience that actually gave me, I only see it as positive and I'm sorry. That's just maybe what I, yeah. I accept that that's what I do innately. Um, 
and I'm in the new me. And that's just part yeah. of my identity is being, is having survived that stroke. It changed my brain and, like for the better for me. Yeah. Um, wow. And so now finding my, my feet in my new life as a survivor is, is a whole journey. And then you return to that like journey with yeah. mental health and, and physical well-being and and everything not that the two are separate but you know what I mean I know what you mean and you talk too about setbacks and and trying not to let those you know be more than they are that's just the regular flow of the day-to-day -day, right of all of us but especially when you're when you're recovering from something like a stroke how do you coach yourself in the moment from when you do have those setbacks? How do you get through them without letting them become monstrous? I struggle. Um, there are times like it, it's, it's uneven. One thing that is hard, it's hard to remember, but like, like I just need a lot of rest and I don't think that's unique to a stroke survivor. Mm -hmm. Um, so like building in rest, like naps were like my superpower when I first got home, mm. um, for recovery. And it was like, I'd had a brain like wash. It's just like so much better than you get up again. It's like, it's like being a baby, right? Like your brain is repairing these things as you sort of have like, like babies need naps to just refresh. Um, yeah. so a good night's sleep, like there are things that I think maybe, maybe clinging to or having the touchstone of things like, like rest, well, that's different things, sleep and rest. Yes, um, yeah. You know, getting outside the, um, eating properly. So I'm still challenged by these things that are like the basics of good health and mental health. I, I, you know, I don't find that easy, but I think to have those touchstones, like, I think that helps me, mm -hmm. um, to kind of like, again, that's controlling what we can. Right. And then yeah. that, that helps. And of course, like friends, people, like I get through and I, I can't, you know what, I would never, ever, ever say that it's been easy, yeah. but there's something driving me forward that I think you can feel. Yeah. And um, I have this enthusiasm for life and to reconnect and for people. And um, I can't be on all the time. That's for sure. I have limited energy now, but, and time, but like, but yeah, like there's this motivation, this drive and, and the music is just, it's so much a part of that. Totally. And just trying to help other people somehow with, I hope that the music can, can give people something. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I already know that it can. And I, I'm so excited for your return to the stage and uh, to see you, of course, in in our old stomping grounds. Uh, maybe we'll just do a final shout out for your shows that are coming up, Alana. What are the details? May 23rd at the Marigold Cultural Center um, with Champagne Weather. We're so excited. Like, that's going to be... Oh, they're so great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm um, so excited for, for that show. And then June 1st, we're doing a release show in Halifax at uh, St. Paul's Anglican Church. And Oh, nice it, venue. Yeah. Um, St. Paul's is a big part of like a part of our world and our community. So, um, and a choir called Les Bois d'Acadie who supported me in my stroke recovery um, with gifts of food and like just generosity and kindness and love. Like they, they're joining us. Um, Moira and Claire are opening or like oh. supporting. So um, there's so much coming together for, for these shows that yeah. you feel it's easy to feel alone. And I think like, I feel that the, I just have a hunch that, these are going to be even more than what I can imagine. And it's scary for me. It's scary for me to come up like, but it's going to be really cool. It's going to be so great. And I, I'm just so excited and I'm so glad that you're doing well and, and back playing and everything I've seen so far has just been amazing. So I can't wait for next week. Thank you. Thank you so much for chatting with me, Alana. It's been a great, a great conversation and, and you're so inspirational. It's funny. I was thinking about you the other day um, and I was like, one word I would use to describe Alana is just, is grace. Like you just have this grace about you. You're rolling oh, your eyes you. for anybody who's not watching on YouTube. Just, there's, <laughs> and this just, you've always had this just grace and this quiet confidence. And I, I just admire you so much. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sam. Likewise. 
thanks again to Alana for overthinking with me and for her vulnerability, her honesty, and just for being an amazing human. And thank you for listening. Thanks again to the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia for supporting this podcast.